Hello YouTube and welcome to the next episode of my Revolutionary Girl Utena reaction series. Back here again this week for some more Revolutionary Girl Utena. As always, I am indecisive and don't know how many episodes I'm going to watch. I'm going to say one for now. We'll see if there's enough there to analyze and make like a full video. Again, I have Mondays off. Utena series is lucky for that. It's the only series where I have like that day off every week where I can devote time if I want to, right, and really deep dive. That's why I'm kind of keeping Mondays open for a little bit more. Important stuff is a, is a wrong way to say it, but the stuff that requires a little bit more analysis, let's say. I, I normally reserve that for the Monday for that reason. And buckle in, because I've, I've got some fucking tangents to go on based on this comment section, so I'll bring up those comments now. Um, a few of which are, like, ridiculously long, so we'll try to get through that one. Thank you, Airwave. But yeah, strangely enough, my biggest deep dive is probably just on this from Pencil Sharp. Um, and this from Choba Ribby as well. Like, th that's my deepest dive here today, is based on this, because it insinuates a lot of stuff and got my brain ticking. So let me just read the comment verbatim, just to get us off the off the ground here. I suggest you think a little more about the visual metaphor of Anchi kissing Torga's sword, why Utana can't watch, and her using a prop sword borrowed from Jiri. I think it came up in Revue Starlight 2 with Takarazuka's unique gender roles. And just rounding us off here, notice the posing of the characters as well. So let me bring up that scene and it will get me, you know, so so I can show the scene we're talking about, basically. Okay, just set in the scene here, we have Torga. He's about to power up his blade using Anchi here. Very, very cool. This is a previously unseen power of the Rose Bride plus the Sword of Dios or whatever the hell, right? It's meant to... It's, it's like a power scaling thing. It's meant to make Torga look like a big boss type guy. But I think it gets more interesting when we talk about it metaphorically. Cast off your body and protect the sword. Utena notices. Anchi obeys. Very cool. Anchi comes over to the sword, kneels down, grabs the sword, and kisses it. Utena is watching on uh, in intently, let's say. Conflict. Utena is conflicted about this. Himamiya. She bends down, kisses the sword, and then this one's the kicker. <laughs> I'm caught between this and this. We can't see Torga, but he's holding the sword over here. I'm placed in the middle. That's what I'm thinking the posing of the characters is getting at, right? And she can't bear to watch. She can't bear to watch this she looks away, she hates this. She hates being confronted with this idea. And then from there, we do like some lightsaber bullshit or whatever. So you know, let's go back to the comments. So what am I trying to not so subtly insinuate here? I believe Utena, and I've said this a number of times, is caught between the two roles, right? The role of the princess and the role of the prince. By seeing this, I think she's coming to the understanding that if, in truth, I want to be with the guy that's the prince, I will one day have to bend down and kiss the sword. And I don't think Uten is the type of person to want to kiss the sword. It's, it's, a, it's a genuine power imbalance in the male-female relationship that is shown there. Utena realizes that, hey, she's caught between two minds. It's like one or the other. She can't bear to look. She doesn't want to be confronted with this idea of needing to pick one of these roles. Maybe, and just maybe, this calls for a bit of a revolution. <laughs> so she doesn't need to pick one of these roles, one of these two things. And then back to Pencil Sharp's comment here, right? Why are we talking about Takarazuka Revue? Uh, and I've done a little bit of research here. As I did, you know, back in the day for Revue Starlight, of course, as well. We are, what, what are they called here? The Otoko Yaku and the Musumiyaku, the, the, the two groups, right? So again, Crash Course, Takarazuka Revue, very popular theater troupe in Japan with a pretty specific casting quirk, I guess I would say. All female cast. Everybody is, again, biologically female, blah, 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 blah. If you want to extrapolate that out, you can and have that conversation. I'm compartmentalizing that for now. So Otoko Yaku, that is the male roles in the in the plays that they put on as a theater troupe right so you have female actresses 
putting on the male parts. And I think this was the best demonstration I saw of it. Um, Yuna Sakai just goes into the history here a little bit. I, I read this whole article. I thought it was pretty good. And this is the part I zeroed in on the most, right? The reason why the founder Kobayashi started the Otokoyaku was to cultivate the performers into perfect wives for their husbands. Kobayashi thought that teaching the performers how to portray an ideal masculine figure would enable women to understand the qualities of men and also become more appreciative towards men. Thus, the reason why Kobayashi added Otogiyaku was to glorify masculinity. However, in current times, I believe this has kind of been reclaimed, right? One of the reasons Takirazuka Revue has gained popularity is the Otogiyaku, the male roles played by women who appear astonishingly androgynous, right? And th this is where I'm coming into Judy, right? I had a small discussion about Judy and Utana and maybe being caught between two different gender roles and what that may mean via androgyny. And it's an interesting discussion to have, I think. This role leaves a mysterious image of Takarazuka Revue, which caught fans' attention. The performers have received criticism for being abnormal due to female performers dressing and behaving masculine. However, this masculine behavior and appearance caught the fans' attention and created a fan base called Zuka Fan. And then jumping to the conclusion here a little bit, analyzing the Takarazuka history enables us to see how Takarazuka taught Japanese society that gender could be inherited. It allows the fans to create an asexual and agendered fantasy space that surpasses the expectation of gender roles in the community. And then jumping over to the Wikipedia article, we have a pretty similar thing described here as well, with an excerpt from Takarazuka scholar Laurie Brow. In Brow's view, the Otokiyaku represent the woman's idealized man, free from the roughness or need to dominate found in real life. I've talked a lot about masculine competitiveness and that kind of thing as portrayed in Utena, this is definitely coming through here. It is these male roles that offer an escape from the strict, gender-bound real roles lauded in Japanese society. In a sense, the Otokoyaku provides the female audience with the dream of what they desire in reality. And I just find all this stuff so damn interesting. And again, I I, I should pop over to this one, actually. I find this stuff so damn interesting because uh, we kind of went into this a little bit in Review Starlight, but not the deep dive. This is clearly like Ikuhara really, really understanding the history and his influences and the societal impact of those and putting a unique spin on it, making characters... It, it, it's set in an older time. It's not set in the 90s, right? It's them going through a kind of similar experience through history through their own organic, made-up history. I don't know if I'm making any sense, but I just, I, I thought that this was really cool. It shows that Ikuhara really fucking gets what he's talking about. And all of this came from just me re-looking at one scene, right? That got my brain fucking going crazy. It, it's, it's, this show's fucking really good. Um, again, we talked about this a little bit in Review Starlight, and you guys should, what's that one part in the Review Starlight movie where it's like Claude and Maya dancing in that whole sequence? Watch that one. It, it, it kind of talks about similar stuff. Um, and it's really cool looking. You guys should just watch the Review Starlight movie if you haven't. Um, yeah, so that's a well and good. But now I've got like a ton of other comments to go through. So we're going to do that as well. Oh, and I forgot to mention the, the jury connection, right? And the prop sword. That's what gives us the link into uh, theater as an idea and helps reinforce this and helps it to feel less nebulous, helps it to feel more connected to the thing, right? And again, Judy, Utana, the two peas in the same pod, they're pretty interesting in that regard using this theming, right? It's pretty cool. Either way, Victoria, next comment here. Hey, Jury, thanks again for using your goat powers to sense exactly when I'd need a dueling weapon with no forewarning. Listen, uh, was that sword insured? It certainly did get smashed by, um by Torga's super lightsaber, um, but she still won in the end, so that's all well and good. I'm pretty sure that's all Judy really cared about, is uh, I don't think that she likes Torga very much, I'm gonna be real with you, which uh, which kind of tracks. Dead albino sheep, next comment here, kind of zeroing in on a little bit of my uh, organic analysis last week, the stuff that I came to initially, my initial reaction, right? You're definitely asking the right questions regarding if this is good or not, if we should be celebrating unanimously this victory. Again, in combination with what I was just talking about with, with the roles, right? That is very much Utena falling back into the prince role in, in the end of... You know, remember her weird smile at the end of episode 12? That That's like, I'm back on my bullshit. I'm back on my prince bullshit. And again, there's a system, a certain system need to be revolutionized to the point where that 
doesn't have to be the case anymore. I don't have to choose one or the other. The second paragraph here talks a little bit more about the recap, how despite it being a you know pretty important recontextualization of the dual system, it also changes it changes our structure a little bit. Torga seemed like the big boy in charge. He seemed like the guy pulling the strings, right? With the presentation of this new guy, supposedly Archie's brother, um, who has a way, way more concrete understanding of what the duels are and the stained glass windows and actually went up to the castle and talked with the guy. Th that guy's the guy in charge. That guy understands what the fuck's going on. Um, and Torga's probably... Is he on the phone with him? Is that guy the end of the fucking world? I don't know. Um, a lot of questions need to be asked there for sure. Um, just nice power scaling stuff. There is people beyond Torga. Torga may be small fry compared to who we're actually going to be dealing with here. This comment here was interesting too by Victoria again. Um, the Shadow Girls, right? Uh, there was a previous Shadow play where one was begging to be allowed to believe in UFOs. How might that interact with the episode 12 reveal? Now I need to go back and check the context of the UFOs and believing in UFOs and where that was in the rest of the story and what the UFOs may be tantamount to. Let me try and find it. I'm, I'm going to try and be a good boy here and do my research. So it was in episode 9 with Sionji and believing in something eternal. Okay, so maybe something eternal does exist because UFOs exist, right? Because the whole thing's like, let me believe in something that nobody believes in or is provably false or something like that. Because it's nice to have a little bit of joy still in my life, a little bit of unknown. Because I, I, when I was young, I used to read all these stories about princes on horses and fairies and wizards and all this kind of stuff, right? And now I know that isn't true. But let me have this little bit of magic. So maybe this little bit of magic actually is legitimate. Maybe there's some legitimacy to that. Because in episode 12, the reveal I think you're speaking about is that the Shadow Girls are like fucking aliens and they get on a fucking they get on a UFO. Is that what we're talking about? Something eternal may actually exist here for Sionji, or anybody else for that matter. The power may be legitimate. We'll see. That's what I'm getting from this anyway. Either way, moving on, I was pretty uncharitable to Utena last reaction, I thought, last video. Uh, and I see is kind of pulling me back into line a little bit. At least that's what I'm reading this as, right? So, so Utena still did learn an important lesson, especially comparatively to the early duel, the, the choice one, right? With, with Sionji, episode two. Like, she didn't learn something overall. She didn't learn anything big or wide and overall show messagey, right? She just learned that this is something that I legitimately want, and I will fight for what I want. I'm going to fight for what I believe in. <laughs> Revolutionary? You get what I mean. But, like, she's actually invested in this Archie thing now. It isn't a thing of, okay, I'm, like, protecting Archie because Sanji's like, a bad guy. I'm protecting Archie because I care about Archie, and I want Archie to be better, even if that's for my own personal gain, that's like yet to be decided or whatever, right? But it's something that she wants, and it's something that she's willing to fight for, and I think that's important. That's an important step for her anyway. There's a few fun time codes here from Choboribi as well. Still fucks me up that what snaps Utena out of her funk is Wakaba making an accusatory assumption about Archie and not any of Wakaba's stuff. There's some Wakaba shit coming. I'm sure there is, right? Like, Wakaba's so nice and she gets nothing. So, <laughs> we're keeping an eye out for that. Poor Wakaba. Apparently I made a good catch here with the contradictions between Utena's ideals and reality. Her normal is acting as the prince, but by acting as the prince, she is just joining the game that turns Anshi into an object again. Again, no matter what Utena does, she can't seem to fit in as either prince or princess. Again, we talked about that before. And yeah, we kind of just talked about this as well. It's important that Utena is now fighting for something, right? So I may have said, okay, it's not inherently a selfless act, Utena saving Archie here, but what it's it's more important for Utena. It's her actively choosing that she's better off with Archie. Again, I think there's plenty of show left to talk about what Anchi may think of all this and that kind of thing, right? Then we're on Airwave 2K2's comment here, which mainly talks through this section about... Utena not really having a sword, not really having a sword to claim as her own, right? Because when she was owner of the Rose Bride or whatever and had the Sword of Dios, that's not really her sword per se. It's just a perk of being the guy. In episode 12, borrowing Judy's sword, like, and it's a prop sword. It's not even a real sword. Like, does she truly believe in what she's 
saying here, right? I think by the end of episode 12, she most certainly is. And I'd be interested to see next time we do a Rose Duel, if she just has a sword of her own. I don't know, or it changes somewhat, something like that. I don't know. I have neglected to mention, I think enough, a huge portion of the, the title of the show, which is again, revolutionary. Um, and all the French in the show maybe as well. And uh, justifying things with the power of God, the power of Dios, right? There's this baggage there for sure, for sure, for sure. Up to and including uh, Rose of Versailles as an influence as well. So, you know, we'll, we'll, you know, it, it, it'll come to the fore, I'm guessing, as we continue. And I'm sorry, but just in the interest of time, you guys should go read this comment because it's very, very well researched. But we go into each of the other characters in the show and what their sword means and what that sword may be used to do and that kind of thing, right? Going through Sayonji and Miki and, and Jiri and, and Torga and that kind of thing, right? It's it's pretty well done, right? And yeah, it goes to show the amount of effort that's been put into this show for sure. The, the, the understanding of all these kind of things. Last comment here today, we have Maximiliano Ramirez Romero with a few scanner shot points here. First asking to think about the cape on the prince in episode 13, right? White on the outside, pure on the outside, red, potentially sinful, potentially bloody on the inside. Maybe hiding something inside that is a little bit more sinister. Maybe this egg that we're supposedly supposed to be breaking the shell of. Maybe that's not something we should be going into, you know. Revolutions are generally not um, unviolent affairs, <laughs> for lack of a better term. They're not particularly peaceful. Um, I seem to remember a lot of head chopping off in history <laughs> when it comes to the French Revolution, so... I don't know. Food for thought, maybe. On the topic of revolution, it is not only a radical change, it is also the turn of a wheel. Now, this goes into a large conversation between a number of parties about, hey, should we interpret Japanese texts with an English meaning? Is Ikuhara well-researched or smart enough to think of that kind of thing? There's evidence in the opening that says, take my revolution as a kind of flowers turning around and that kind of thing. Like... I don't know. Because I, I never think of, a, when you say revolution, I never think of revolution as a revolution of a circle, mostly because I wasn't that good at math. But you're right, it definitely is something that can be considered, and that turns into, hey, is this Ikuhara's intention? Is this their intention? Is this a death of the author type situation? I don't know. I think analyses are more cool when you take in more elements. So I'm going to imagine that he thought it was cool and included it and thought it was a nice double meaning pun thing. But either way, like circular spinning, dueling arena, lots of twirling imagery and that kind of thing, lots of gears, again, the turning roses in the opening as a very obvious example as well. I'm, I'm inclined to believe that it's true. Also here reframing the choice duel, right? Because there's also the side of Sionji's choice. And this is duel two, I believe, episode two, with Sionji making the choice to want to regain the tool so he can find eternity, that tool being Anchi, wanting to regain the Rose Bright, making that choice to duel again. Sionji's very good at making bad choices. He's very, very good at that. This is also a thing that has been in the show subtextually and I haven't really said aloud, right? So think about history, right? Using uh, marrying people off, right? Using family connections and specifically daughters as kind of bargaining chips in diplomacy and that kind of thing throughout history without consent, arranged marriages, even if you wanted to bring in um, an, a, a Southern Asian spin to it, right? Because aren't she's kind of that way inclined character design wise would be an interesting way to take it as well. Finally, with the Shadow Girls and the Alien, there is someone behind the Alien Shadow Girls that knows everything is going and uses everyone as puppets like a king with his court. Is that the one in episode 13 where there's somebody behind the aliens that has like the fucking fishing rod and is like making the shadow puppet thing happen? Kind of like there's somebody behind the scenes pulling the strings on the whole play we've been seeing up to this point? I think maybe that's what you're getting at. But um, either way, I've talked for like half an hour. Oh my God. <laughs> so now we're going to finally jump into uh, episode... What episode are we even up to? 14? That sounds right. Let's go watch episode 14 of Revolutionary Girl Utana. We're supposedly... Oh, I didn't even talk about one of my most interesting things from last episode. Oh my God. This is important recappy stuff. Let me get rid of the comments. Um, so, okay. The, 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 let me just get up the episode. The, the, this will be this will be like a good refresher. Okay, chat room. This is like the one of the last scenes of episode thirteen. This is supposedly Archie's big brother, which I don't think we have a name for yet. Um, he's walking out of the castle, 
or whatever, right? And this silhouette figure here seems to be Anshi. It looks a lot like Anshi. She's got the puffed shoulders of the girls' school uniform and the, the head shape's the same. The old adage in character design, if you can tell a character by their silhouette, they're probably a good design. I'm imagining this is Anshi, right? Either way, if it's Anshi or not, there's still a contradiction in the preview of episode 13. Master Utena, allow me to introduce my big brother. Huh? You have a brother? He doesn't know about me being the Rose Bride or about the Duelist's Code. Yeah, he fucking does. We know he does. He, we had a whole episode about that here. He clearly does. <laughs> what, 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 why, are we lying to Utena? Why? Why is Anshi lying to Utena? And then I was I was extrapolating things and thinking, hey, this whole thing with the prince here and this guy and Anshi maybe some kind of family connection thing? Again, skin tone maybe the indicator there. I don't know. Um, that's scary because it makes it seem like Utena is going to get blindsided again and there's way more going on. So that's my overall prediction is that this guy knows more than he's letting on there's also apparently like a uh, there's like a black rose dudes there's like a bunch of dudes i don't know i seem to remember seeing somewhere that this next arc is called like something about black roses we're gonna see what that means right again the roses have represented different duelists is it gonna be a guy with black hair is it gonna be a load of guys with black hair i don't know but i've yapped successfully like way too much now so time for some show stuff so if you like the video consider liking the video if you like the video and you want to see more consider subscribing to the channel 950 i just hit which is very cool on the way to a thousand if you haven't subscribed please consider doing so comment below if you want me to go insane and read your comments and go down rabbit holes that's always fun uh twitter you can follow me on twitter and i'll follow you back and that kind of thing and the discord join discord talk about utana vote on things blah 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 discord cool um i'm going to watch episode 14 of revolutionary girl lieutenant right now radio episode 14 up there ready to go 23 minutes and 27 seconds on this one so please sync up accordingly as always there would be a picture and picture version in the description below and using the some stuffs lieutenant subset thing it's pretty cool um <laughs> i'm gonna give it a three two one now and I'm, we're gonna watch the episode so radio three two one go Revolution, look at it. It's like a circle. Yeah, this opening fucking rips. There's also so much visually to look at. Like I'm I'm already seeing so much contrast between Utena and Anshi. And like like going hands. Um, you guys got me inspired today. I was like kind of sitting down, I'm like tired. I actually went for a massive walk this morning as well, like 10Ks or something. So I'm kind of hyper, had a coffee. Um, I'm up and about. And then I started researching for the comments section and I just went insane. So this is like the only show I'm currently doing on the channel that makes me go like insane. And I haven't felt that way for a while. So Utena fucking rocks for that reason. This shit came out in the 90s, dog. What the? What is everyone else doing? Make more shows like this. What are we all doing? I don't know. <laughs> On my soapbox today. I'm not... All this stuff here? This stuff in the opening? I'm excited. I'm ready to be there. It almost looked like we were jousting against each other for a moment before we started riding off in the same direction. We'll say. Alright, talk to me. Talk to me, revolutionary girl Utena. That's a very striking image. Okay. Under the under the mansion? Ooh. Indeed. This is our guy. Let me crank it a little bit too, it's a little bit quiet. Dunno. Who was talking there? That's not who I thought it was. Maybe that is an Anchi, maybe that's that character. Okay, never mind. Maybe I was going insane for the wrong reasons. Hello, boys of the Black Rose. Um, interested. That didn't go the way I expected at all. 
No, but the silhouette still looked like Anchi and the hair. Maybe I'll need to compare. Indeed. It's a foreboding tone early. Going to class on a Saturday? Is that a Japan thing? She got takeout? No, she got a cake. Okay. Where does she go on Saturday nights? Don't fall out the window with the cake, man. Oh, we're back to Utena summer as well. I was at school. Visit? Oh. Okay. Choo Choo's about to die, help. Yeah. Elevator? To the... What? What is that? Hmm? Board chairman? Of the school? <laughs> no, my brother isn't an object. Just having a smooch, they're alright. I'm pretty sure they know you're here. Okay. Weirdly edited. And the pink roses? Acting? Interesting. <laughs> From high school, you shouldn't be doing that. <laughs> Bro's dating a high schooler? Interesting. Indeed. Bro is horny as. High schooler, by the way. Am I reading that right? I hope I'm not reading that right. Hmm. Yeah, the students at the school, they never fight. That's the thing. So true. Huh? <laughs> okay. Oh, what's going on there? <laughs> okay, Mikage. He's cool. Samanj something? Okay. So are you like rich rich? Interesting. The picture on the table, huh? So when you down below with with that other person? And he's like a yeah. I was gonna yeah. Tensei. <laughs> oh, hello. I mean you're pretty switched on too.
not qualified. Okay. Huh. Um. Um. He knows, but do you know that he knows? Hello. Hello, Miki. The good old archives, sure. Seventeen. What? Ah! Boy jump scare. What? <laughs> what do you mean buried alive? Huh? What? Oh. Oh. Oh, I don't want that. Who's going to be the duelist? The opening didn't change either. Okay. Yes, this is Kane, right? Kane? Kane? You know what I'm saying. Yeah, yeah. Okay. 18, by the way. Interview at the at the that place where the guy runs like the seminars. There's so much going on. This new character alert, like over all over the place. I need to see what they're all talking about. Okay. Cool. Sc scary. Uh, <laughs> yeah. What is this? I know, problematic. Arranged marriage? I, he looks like a man. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> the butterfly cocoon thing? What does he accept? What is he doing? Y yeah. Well, I don't think she likes you either. Okay. She probably shouldn't have done that. Okay. Aunt she is weird. It's true. Okay. I'm happy that we know that this is uncomfortable. Ooh. Well, I know another party that wants her dead, so...
Interesting. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Terrifying. The shoes is crazy. Indeed. Huh? Metaphorically or for real? Oh. 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 Yeah, we saw one of these last episode. Oh, so this is what I mean by we need a duelist. Okay. This is creepy as fuck. Okay, that's pretty fucking dark. We're not doing a duel this episode, right? Maybe. Oh, shit. <laughs> Wakaba wants to fucking fight. She wants to stick and move. What? Sh Shadow, Shadow girl in real life? What? What is happening? Oh. Okay. Like pulling teeth. Something you have to do but is painful. That's why your ten is going to the arena. Different produced version same old lyrics though mm-hmm mm -hmm. the black rose you reckon rose has been corresponding to hair color a lot we will see that was like that's like the darkest the show's got is like this creepy fucking morgue tunnel elevator that she just went to that's kind of like a confessional as well. What happened there where a hundred students died? I just leave every Utena session with so many damn questions. I'm kind of relating to um, uh, Kane because um, I think Anchi's kind of creepy too. <laughs> so we're both kind of united on that on that front. Obviously, I don't want her dead, but you know, other parties do. Yeah, sh show me, show me you, please. Oh, that's like a hundred students. That are being memorialized. Yeah, I'm freaked out too. Okay, like the chalk on the ground, like a dead body's been here, but it's red. Oh, hello. None. No hair color change. Okay, I'm gonna. I'm gonna kill, aren't you? <laughs> I'm. It may be an aspect of a normal self.
masks. Oh, this is a different track too? Goblin? <laughs> Okay, we're, 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 we're scrapping, we're fighting. There's too many friggin' desks in the way, it's hard to fight. Give me a nice open arena. Yeah, I'm going to kill Archie if you don't win, Utena. Here comes bro. Okay. <laughs> sure. Um, the desks got separated into groups. It's like group work. Yeah. Are you back? from your, you've been like uncorrupted? You're now unconscious? All right, one down, 100 more to go, or 99 more to go. Gotcha. What are you cutting beans or something? Snow peas? It's going to be really awkward this time. Yeah, y yeah. Yeah, she was just sick. She's better now. I don't know. <laughs> you reckon? What? Is it scary? Or is there some secret squirrel business happening? Okay. Mm hmm. Yeah. yeah. Glasses off. Go to the planetarium. Is Bro into his sister? Did you feel lonely this week? What the fuck? <laughs> um. If this show answers all the questions that it's laying out, holy fuck! What what in what a what a crazy show plot reveal wise that starts off so simple. I I know we're introducing like a bunch of new things, a bunch of new factors that will take place in a new arc. I'm guessing, probably another twelve episodes, maybe would make sense to me. And then you would recap that at the end, and then go on another one, and then you're done. Something like that structurally. There's so much to talk about. It's almost insane. But um, I think that that final scene at least confirmed that Archie is lying 
through her teeth a lot for Utena's sake. And knows a lot more about everything that's going on. And also justifies, that justifies a lot of Kane's, Kane's, you you know, her actions. Because she almost, because I believe that she loves her her husband to be right but she, aren't she's in the way is that a thing oh shit really hang on we'll, we'll pause that uh, we'll find out more about that in in due time i wish i had a sibling <laughs> okay Utana. um that's so fucked i'm gonna need to watch that again and tell you what i think and stuff there's a lot to talk about especially in combination with what i talked about at the start of the video i think there was a lot more evidence to my points that i made which is cool. Yeah. Okay. See you in a second. So, episode 14. <laughs> huh? Um, new arc, new characters, new plot lines, new fucking mysteries. Uh, I'm intrigued. I want to know more. Uh, so, we're going to watch this again in the effort of trying to know more. <laughs> That's essentially what we're doing. First, um, I want to look up who the fuck made this because this episode is immaculate. I know I say it every week, but this is one of the best episodes of the show. Um, from a construction point of view, how different it feels, how sinister it feels. Um, seems like we're going through this almost corruption type storyline, right? Where we can have kind of black rose certain people and they're going to reveal their innermost things that they keep hidden, right? You know, this kind of theme of secrets and keeping things secret from other people, further established, of course, by the end here with Anshi and whatever the hell is going off there, taking off her glasses, revealing, taking off her mask, revealing the real her and doing something which Utana is not allowed to see. Not even inviting Choo Choo. Choo Choo's even left behind. Choo Choo goes with Anshi fucking everywhere. So what the fuck is this? What is going on? And again, like... He doesn't know anything about this duel stuff, right? Thanks for not telling my brother all that. He clearly knows. He knows everything. I don't know. This is confusing me. Um, but I, I just love like foreboding secrets under the under the under the house, right? Under the house very early. This shot from here through to like down, 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 underground. There's something hidden within. There's some secret thing that nobody else knows. And these secret things that are being revealed to everyone based on these black roses, apparently. That is that is a hook. That is an intriguing fucking premise. And I think it's executed on every facet of the production of this episode and this arc thus far. Um, again, I'm going to see who made this now. Guess what I found, chat room? Um, if you go over here and then you look at this and you go, Katsuyo Hashimoto uh, did episode 14, apparently. You click on it and it just links you to Hosoda. That's just, it's a Hosoda joint, everybody. You know episode 7, how I said that was one of the best episodes of the show, and then it was storyboarded by Hosoda? This one also is. So, he's very good. And here we say, also known as Katsuyo Hashimoto. So, again, I don't need to go through all of this, but acclaimed director. If you were to list, like, five anime directors at the moment, he probably comes up. And that's, uh, that talks to his quality. I really like Bell. I thought Bell was pretty good. Everyone kind of shits on Bell. I thought it was good. Um, obviously, I haven't seen Wolf Children, which is the main one people like him for. But again, we're not doing a Hosoda moment. He's just, he's very, very good. He's hes very good at the this whole anime production business. Um, and this episode here just sings. It's, it's wonderful. If you wanted a specific director for the episode as well, you have Yukio Okazaki as well. So that's all well and good. Let's go back to the episode now. And as I've already explained, this opening scene goes like from this, you know, palatial type beat this building that we see a number of times i know it has a proper name we'll, we'll get into it uh but we go down below there's a cd underbelly down below it and we see this character i automatically assumed that this was the brother right before hearing the voice a drop falls and old mate mikage i think his name is he appears out of nowhere and says how is it that this rose can bloom in the depths of the earth so far outside the sun's reach this is an unnatural rose and here's why this black rose instead of absorbing sunlight it absorbs darkness right that what that's what helps it grow it feeds off the darkness potentially inside ourselves and that's how it gets its power so potentially, the darker somebody's other side is, the more powerful it may be. 
we may see. And then we get a bit of lore here. We, listen, we also hear your voice. Your voice is, you're voiced by a female voice actress. You seem to be androgynous in design. You say that you're a boy. You sound like a girl. You got some anchi type qualities. Anchi? I sound very Australian there. Anchi. Um, I'm interested in you. I want you to have a big long, I want you Judy and Utana to get in a room and just fucking talk it out. That's what I really want. <laughs> again, I, I want you to talk to Utana. That would be fucking really interesting. Um, again, based on a lot of what I've been talking about this video. Either way, the law, um, Kiryu, which is Torga, um, has been missing school as of late. The academy has been quiet as a result. A proper academy should be a peaceful place of study, according to you, as opposed to it being rambunctious and full of duels and stuff. So that's like a cold open. It, 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 you know, offers a lot of questions. I don't know what to make of any of that initially. Now that I've got a little bit more context, I know a little bit more of what to make of it. This is why rewatching episodes is good, guys. It helps you, you know, what if I just went off to the next one now and didn't like relook at that and go like, oh, this is what the roses do. It's pretty clear. Again, I don't know how we're doing it. Foreboding tone. What is it? This into this, this like deep shadow and like the lack of music and just the sound of the elevator. And aren't you saying, well, I shall be going and then walking away. That's her walking, right? I think so. That would be her walking back to her room after whatever the Saturday night session is. Secrets. Hidden stuff. You know? The theme of the episode. Either way, Utana's back. It was a Saturday night. She had a bit of fun with the rest of the class, apparently, whatever that may mean. Um, there's a cake on the windowsill, which are apparently leftovers from the party. I didn't see her sit them down anywhere, but, but I digress. That's also like a full cake. How is that a leftovers? Does, does, did nobody eat cake? <laughs> Let them eat cake? Oh my god. Um, I don't know. What, what do you, who did you hang out with? Did you hang out with like Wakaba and friends? Maybe. And we set up the premise of Anchi not being around on a Saturday night, right? Which again is, is solved by the end of the episode. Good episode structure stuff. Pose questions, answer questions. You know, you could also be a dork and say we're contrasting dark with light because it's very well lit in the room right now. But when we go to the planetarium, it's it's dark and dingy, and there's long shadows, and we're in the in the stars. We're feeding off the the, the moonlight and the stars instead of the sun, which grows the roses. You could be a dork and go that way for sure. And I am a dork for the record. Lieutenant starts asking questions here like, oh, you're normally away on Saturday nights. Anchi looks uncomfortable, but she still kind of tells the truth here. Like, hey, I've, I've been asked to meet with my brother. You are meeting with your brother. That's true. Just not in the way we think, I don't think. It definitely, it definitely had a, it had a romantic tone. Correct me if I'm wrong. Am I, am I too monogatari pilled? Am I too incest brained? Um, I don't know. <laughs> But it feels that way. Oh, this is fantastic too. So remember this shot I paused on before and the shadow was the other way? Now the shadow is... This is the morning as opposed to the afternoon late in the night, right? Different face at different times of day based on light and dark. I love that. So also, you reckon the guy with the with the rose elevator... The rose... The rose elevator? Uh, do you reckon that guy doesn't know about the rose duels and the rose bride? Are we... What are we doing? <laughs> the other thing is this is the board chairman's office, right? We see the, the linkage to the board chairman in a second, and I'll talk about it because it's juicy. Um, but this implies that the whole school and the structure of the school is in on this dueling shit. Why else is there fucking roses everywhere? Other than roses just look cool. Uten is kind of stupid, and she looks at the, uh, the big old planetarium thing and goes, Is this your brother? No, he's not an object. Um, and then, okay, so Utena peeks around the corner and sees these two smooching. This is another element of contrast, right? So in the daytime, I smooch with my wife-to-be, who's also a high schooler. When night falls, I smooch, maybe, with my sister, Rose Bride, who isn't my wife-to-be but instead is my sister. You know, I have, I have one for the daytime, one for the nighttime. One that's the open relationship, one that's a bit of a secret. I don't know. Anything? Is this anything? Either way, Uten is kind of embarrassed. There's quite a weird edit here where we walk towards the elevator, but then we cut straight into uh, talking with the brother. And this guy here, his name is Otori Akio. Okay, first thing I'm noticing is your name, you don't share any names with 
with Anshi, right? That you say that you're big brother? Weird. Okay. Utena starts asking the questions here. So your brother is the board chairman? No, 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 only acting board chairman. The actual board chairman is Kane's father. Hello. That, 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 that is Kane. She is a huge part of this episode. So right now, like this is almost like arranged marriage type shit that we were talking about before. Using partners, right? For political and social gain and as pieces on a board rather than actual human people right and again different time but I, I was i was sus on this through the reaction as well um i'm planning to marry this guy as soon as i graduate from high school one you look like you're 26 but that's neither here nor there um two that's called grooming <laughs> in the business um i'm going to marry you when you are old enough to be married suspect for sure i don't i'm not sure on this whole akio guy i think he might not be like a good guy i think he may be a bad guy all right this, this is this hints everywhere too right it's like this is a weird boardroom yeah the truth is my passion lies in stargazing as opposed to anything else that may be an element in my life you know the stars what else do we associate with the stars the, the end of the episode here. Whatever he has with Anshu. He likes stars so much that it's abnormal. Some people think he got himself adopted into my family just for access to this equipment. Like he may be using me and my status as some kind of vehicle. Weird. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm feeling sorry for you more and more. I thought that you were kind of crazy and stuff. But you're just paranoid with good reason, I think. I think there's some suspect stuff going on and you've been offsided a little bit. You may like the guy, but he's got some weird shit going on. When I use the telescope to observe the stars I've come to know, they show me their hidden selves. There's this look on your face? Yeah, this is clearly indicating stuff for the scene later in the episode, right? Spare a thought for me once in a while, says Kane. If I discover a comet, I'll name it after you. Very deep, husky voice. This is obvious now in retrospect. It's so funny. That's that's hilarious. And then he has to be trolling here. Um, I've only been at this school a short while, but I know I know one thing for sure. These kids, they never fight. There's never duels or anything. Clearly, I think looking Utena in the eye and knowing who Utena is and trying to goad something out, maybe. Yeah, staring her like like I hope it stays that way, like like trying to suss her out, I think. Nothing bad ever happens at Authority Academy. There's no secret bullshit under the, under the fucking building. There's there's no secret anything. Nothing bad ever happens, right? Bad shit happens all the time, up to and including a hundred students dying from something that we will talk about. Yeah, literally, like they know, right? Because there's the cut from again, if it wants to behave, there's the cut from like nothing bad ever happens at the school to Black Rose being plucked. Nothing bad ever happens, except for this. <laughs> yeah, this really uncomfortable smile from Archie through all of this. Kane's like, you can call me, you know, on their son sometimes, right? Because, um, you know, I'm going to marry your brother. That'll be like kind of like a family connecting type thing. You can, you know, stop being so formal with it, right? And then three cuts back and forth here. Let me just grab them. Like there, 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 there. Hi. Like, pfft. <laughs> that is drama. That is that is a clashing between those two characters for sure. Very well directed. And then we're into Mikage, right? Who seems like a genius student type guy. He's a, you know, tortured genius type character. That's what I'm getting from him. He has two like academy dudes like thanking him because of his paper our research lab got picked for the advisory board. And okay, like 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 we we got to give him gifts, right? So my wife went to a hot spring resort, and we got the 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 manju, right? That's like a classic tradition type thing. And then oh shit, forgive me for beating around the bush. We're actually just gonna fucking pay you, right? This is only a pittance, but we're gonna pay you a ton because we know that how important you were to us getting this privileged position on this board or whatever. But he's not interested in that. He's not interested in the brown nosing and the. The, the corporate BS and all that kind of stuff. He's more focused on something else. His own research at the moment and the picture on the table, guys. Like, let's let's not beat around the bush here. Um, he probably likes this person quite a bit, up to and including romantically. And, I mean, that's two boys liking each other. 
That's that's pretty scary, right? We don't we don't we don't know about that. Um, yeah, I mean, it's not the first uh, uh, homosexual implied thing in the show. Let's put it that way. Either way, this scene is meant to demonstrate how important Mikage is, right? He's just super genius guy. This is very interesting as well. We we just hear the two dudes like conversation after the fact, just expositing stuff to us. Like they've left the room, but we still get to hear the conversation. That was the charismatic high schooler who hosts the Mikage Seminar. What an overpowering aura. I lost my nerve. The Mikage Seminar, also known as the Black Rose Society. It's rumored that they even have a minister among their ranks and odds are it's true. What do you mean by minister? Like a very important person used to come from this elite clique? Okay, that shouldn't be surprising to any of us. The entire faculty reaps, reaps plenty of benefits by associating with him. Yeah, and then and then we're we're bringing Mickey in, right? Where we're Mickey's trying to be scouted by this privileged society that all the important people come from. Fair enough, he's a smart bloke, and he's also a first year. Makes sense. And here's the thing, right? Mickey says no, doesn't accept this offer at least initially, to be in this prestigious organization. They're both enjoying a nice brew here at the moment as well. Um, Mickey doesn't think he's smart enough. Is that, is he lying? Does he sense something nefarious afoot? Or does he just not believe in himself enough to this point? He's definitely not on Mikage's level, let's be real. But a mind like Mickey's is the mind that he was looking for. Now, what did you mean by that? <laughs> What did you mean by that? And with that, just like politely declining and walking out, and we'll coincidentally meet Anchi and Utena here, who are both walking out of their meeting with uh with Akio. Um, and okay, listen, okay, let's break this down. Thank you for not telling my brother about my secrets. Okay, well your brother knows your secrets, so, but why are you? You're not hiding anything from him. If anything, you're, we're flipping it. You're hiding stuff from Utena, right? But you, you, you up to this point have been so subservient to the Rose Master, whoever that may be, right? Whoever, whoever owns the bride at that moment. You've been so, so, so subservient to them. There is a level above this game which you are hiding things from still, right? Which, which has more control over you than this game does at this current time. There are bigger fish here. It's not just, it's, this is this is your trademark, oh, this show is way bigger than I thought, right? Like, I thought I had everything under control. There was stuff in the background already happening that was way bigger than I thought, which is just, it's a cool feeling. I love it when anime does stuff like this. It's the power of serialized television, baby. And this is just tempting fate as well. It's glad that we're not getting them mixed up in it because Kani seems so nice. I would hate it if she got, you know, if she got mixed up in all this dueling stuff. Again, by the end of the episode, that's exactly what has happened. Either way, they just have a nice little cute talk here with Mickey, you know, because these guys are like friends kind of still, despite everything. <laughs> um, and we just explained that we went to see him and Mia's big brother. Mickey says that he needed to check up on some things in the archives and also the whole Makage thing as well. I don't think he's saying at the moment. And Utena remarks that she didn't know this place existed. And now it's time for the lore drop, right? You didn't know about the Nemuro Memorial Hall incident? Oh my god, you don't know? This building has a rather unfortunate history. Cue the cut to all these blokes that are presumably dead. It said that long ago, 100 boys were buried alive here. How did this happen? Was it, did they, did we like gas them all and then put them into like things in a morgue or was there like a cave in or what happened? What happened? I'm, I think they just died of some other kind. I, I don't think they were buried alive. I think there was some other cause of death. I'm going to be real with you. This is one of my favorite creepy pieces of imagery from the episode as well. All the shoes lined up against the walls, right? Shoes that will never be worn by anybody ever again. Really kind of like blending this sinister tone with kind of the school-like imagery. Taking off your shoes before entering a classroom and all that jazz. Wait, their name is Mama Mia? No, <laughs> not quite Mama Mia. Mamiya? Which, again, is like mirroring Himamiya, I'm thinking, because they're like... They're like fake weird Rose Bride. Anyway, this is a very important conversation. This is like our antagonists' motivations 
as revealed up to right now. <laughs> There's probably more, but these guys seem purely antagonistic. They seem like bad news, and this is what they're about. Okay, so, 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 let's just read this verbatim, because it's pretty interesting. You know, Mamiya, it seems you are eligible to be the Rose Bride. Don't you mean groom? I am a boy, after all. Bride suits you better, I will make you into a true Rose Bride. Okay, so you just straight up mirror Utena, whilst also mirroring Archie. Okay, so you have the propensity to be a Rose Bride. Cool. But also, you are biologically male? right now, but a lot of people perceive you as feminine to the point where I will make you into a true Rose Bride, not Rose Groom. Are you voluntarily doing this or is this something being forced upon you by you or what's going on? Again, you mirror Utena, right? Who is biologically female, but likes to put on this prince persona a lot of the time, right? And we're playing with that. You, it's a very interesting split in the dichotomy here, you know. It's, it's a character meant to mirror. We're going to have these characters talk. There's going to be drama and intrigue there for sure. Other weird stuff. Again, you have a darker tone of skin and this color hair. Does that make you somewhat connected to the prince? Maybe. I don't know. Either way, this guy is aware of Power of Dios, aware of the dueling system and whatever the hell and knows the best way to do it is not through Archie, but instead of through you, who also have the power to do the whole Rose Bride thing, whatever that may be during this revolution duel, I'm guessing that will occur. The Secret of Eternity is name dropped there as well, linking to the Sionji stuff. Apparently the end of the world has acknowledged this duo as well, so whatever they're planning, the end of the world or whatever, um, or that place is playing, it was weird. Um, they're, they're in the game. They're, they're players in the game too. And here, here's, the, here's the sticking point. This is the stakes raiser as well. To do this, to, to do what we want to do with the power of Dios and whatever else, we must defeat Tenjo Utena. Fine. We must obtain Himamiya Anshi and then kill her. So it isn't about ownership over Anshi anymore. It's life or death. She will die if Utena doesn't win here. Her life is literally in her hands. Is that a good thing? Is that a bad thing? Blah, 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 blah. I could talk in circles for ages about it. And then the lead in line there, of course, to that end, we need a strong duelist. Q, Kane walking into the building. So apparently Kane has an interview here today. I don't know what the point of this particular hall is, right? It's just like an academic institution has rooms where you would do such a thing, some kind of interview. However, we don't get to see anybody at the counter. It almost seems like it's abandoned and haunted and stuff. Interviewees, please fill out a form and await your turn. So we fill that out. Um, let's try and get a pause on all this sub information. Well, there's not much to be had there. It just tells us that she's 18, which I guess is better than the alternative, which is 17. Still not good. Still not good. Either way, I would say the tone stayed inquisitive up to the ad break there. And then we go straight up. It's like horror show. So first we have all these signs and all these various chairs, maybe that were once filled with the 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 kind of rose boys or whatever the hell, the black rose dudes that got buried alive apparently, um, all pointing in the one direction. Again, a very haunted vibe. Like this is the way you should go, this way, into this door. In use, do not disturb. A very ornate door handle, and then it's almost like we're in like an elevator or something, right? It's in what, it's like a combination between an elevator and like a priest confessional where Kane is having some kind of interview in a very, very claustrophobic, dimly lit place whilst descending into despair um, about stuff. That's why I said it's like a confessional. She's saying what's on her mind. She's saying her deepest, darkest desire type beat. I would not be surprised if this particular sequence is mirrored in subsequent episodes with different characters, and we bring them in and they tell us their whole story and whatever the hell, right? It seems like something, or because because Ikuhara loves repetition, so it seems like something we would repeat and get another similar structure uh, going, much like the walk to the dueling arena and all that shit. As we descend, we see these images faster and faster, right? As we find out, these are, you know, like when you're at a morgue and you pull out the body, they're like those drawers which have humans in them, 
Um, all, all of them representing one of the dudes that died in the Buried Alive thing under Nomuro Hall. So again, it's a very important detail here that uh, Akio was selected for her, right? The board chairman, which is her father, took a liking to him. So that's all well and good. He seems like a good bloke and whatever, but he's definitely hiding stuff. Secrets, right? Hidden information behind the hand right now. But again, we had a whole talk about arranged marriages and power plays and that kind of thing before the episode as well, definitely coming through more prominently as a theme as we continue. This here is another excellent frame, as we see, again, a, a bit more of a descent into madness, almost, from uh, from Kane here. We see the butterfly up here in the, in, the, in the picture frame. It will regress into a cocoon, right? What is that meant to represent? Huh. So right now I am showing my outward mask that I showed everybody, my big beautiful butterfly wings, but they don't know the stuff that's lying beneath, the stuff that happened before, the 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 drama there, and that's when I revert to the cocoon, when I start to talk a little bit about the darkness that hides within. Maybe. Okay. Yeah, we see the cocoon manifest there, uh, Mikage telling her to dive deeper, go deeper, deeper, tell me this secret, right? Tell me this thing that you've got hidden. You're happy with your boyfriend, but, except he has a younger sister, and no matter how hard I try, I just can't bring myself to like her. And at this point, we reverted to a caterpillar, so we're even past the cocoon stage, right? Um, ugly past and whatever, I don't know. Reverting from butterfly, because caterpillar to butterfly, that's a very common metaphor. Butterfly to caterpillar, it's kind of uncharted territory for me personally. It's very interesting though. So either way, there's this really weird story about um, a scarf being given as a gift and then using it as a lens cloth, which I don't know why you care, but sure. But I'm with her on the creepy smile. She certainly does have a creepy smile and she knows how to use it. It looks like she's something not of this world. Oh, uh, italicized text here saying pest as well. Caterpillar, something there. Um, I can't help but think his falling ill co coincides with when that pest started coming to our home. So dad is ill? Is that what you mean? My father, yeah, he, he was falling ill. That pest started coming to our home. I don't think I can do this any longer. I don't think I can... This is pretty classic. Do you guys have like <laughs> family connections that you're not quite very fond of? I, I feel you on this one. Probably not this intense, but you know. I've done all I can to try to like this person, but no, I didn't choose to live with them, put it that way. And then, yeah, just growing in intensity, a bit of camera shake, the grabbing of the photograph here. Um, if I can grab it, like right here, intense, camera shake, beautiful. Love it. Love how this is directed. Growing intensity, and then the elevator hits the bottom. We've hit the darkest descent, and Mikage appears. Therefore, your only choice is to revolutionize the world, right? So, so I'm being presented with... This is like a microcosm of every other presentation of this in the show, right? You have this problem in your life or in your past or something, right? You have to revolutionize the world to change it, right? That That is what you must do. You must be forced into this weird system to do so. Now here's like the super creepy part. The music starts up. We have a glowing one of these fucking grave things. Apparently this is a sacred place where 100 duelists sleep. This room leads to the end of the world, right? That's a very... Intriguing line. I'm not sure how to take it yet. Either way, Makage says the, the student ID, and then we look at the The student doesn't have a name as well. They're, they're prescribed an ID, which is a bit weird. And inside, there is a blackened rose seal. According to him, this is what happens to a rose seal when the dude dies. But personally, Makage finds the black way more beautiful. Um, the darkness inside. He's, a, he's an edgelord. You're an edgelord. You like the darkness. You like the dark emotions and all that shit. Um edgy boy. <laughs> uh, but he's kind of scary here. And then, yeah, we have um, uh, Mamiya here, who's going to use her black rose to do thing. Oh, this is great too. The, the shading change here, the, the, that kind, kind of contrast uh, as the kind of blackened rose takes center frame. This is your new heart, a darkened heart. This is your rebirth claustrophobic scenes. And then, yeah, shoving the rose into your heart which apparently we don't get to see. This is so good. <laughs> the color work is great. Um, 
uh, this is fabulous. This is um, genuinely scary, genuinely unsettling, and makes perfect sense plot-wise. I love it. Again, most certainly seems like the darkest the show has gone, right? Kind of this rose as a view into the heart as well, which could be an idea for the rest of the show. Stabbing it in your chest seems like this is going to outwardly portray inward dark emotions. That's the idea here. So then we pan to Utana. It's late in the day. It I feel a duel coming on at this point. I checked the time left in the episode. I'm like, yeah, we're doing a duel. Um, Wakaba wants to fight people, which I think is meant to be like an ironic twist because Uten is actually going to fight somebody tonight, which is kind of fun. It's another Saturday night as well, I guess I should mention. The school's too freaking quiet at the moment. We need the duels to start back up. Maybe there's been like a little bit of a time skip between episodes 12 and now as well. Yeah, Wakaba's saying, I really wish something shocking would happen. Now, this is blowing me away. What is going on here? We're completely recontextualizing the Shadow Girl scenes that we've seen up to now. So the Shadow Girl scenes had been contained, right? Up to this point. They've been in a small section of a window such as this. Now they're expanded out and they're blending into the real world more and more. You know what we saw when we saw the zoom out in episode 13? Like, hey, this was our view before. This is how much bigger the show gets. This is the same thing being represented. And this is the same thing that's happening in the plot. We used to think it was small and contained to Torga and the Rose Duels and the Student Council and all that kind of stuff. It's way bigger. There's way more going on. And that that's brilliant. That's so good. Um, that is in a class of its own when it comes to mirroring... Uh, what the story is doing at the moment with visual language. It's so good. And there's so many other Shadow Girls. There's, there's, ain't it too early for her? What I'd feared has come to pass. Something, whoever the hell you are. What should we do about this wisdom tooth? We're going to pull a tooth or something? Yeah, uh, is that Utena's voice as she shuts? Okay, so we hear the sound of the locker shutting here. Like, she's asking the Shadow Girl, what should I do? Utena closes that, and I hear her say, get it pulled. They're like blending the Shadow Girls with real life. What the fuck is happening? And Wakaba was just there? It's fucking weird as. Um, weird. That's weird, weird, weird. Either way, pulling teeth. I see this as Utena thinks, okay, this is something I have to do. I don't want to do it, but I do kind of have to go to the dentist and get this tooth out. It sucks, but I kind of have to. Right, it's my it's my duty at this time. She's seeing it as 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 painful work at the moment, and doesn't really want to do this on a Saturday night. I don't know if I'm getting memed because there's like different subtitles than I normally have down the bottom here. Normally it's up the top. Normally it's a different font as well. But is this song different? It feels different. So I don't know. I don't know what's going on there. Um, just something in the production of it, I think. Either way, animation seems much the same as we go through the whole Absolute Destiny Apocalypse section. Either way, there's a key difference when Utena makes her way up to the dueling arena. That would be all these desks with uh, with all the flowers on them. That combined with the silhouettes on the ground indicating the death of all these kids, right? Um, you know, like the chalk on the ground in a, in a murder scene and that kind of thing. It's, you know, where they died next to their desks whilst they were studying in some kind of black rose adjacent thing. Oh no, I don't think they were buried alive. And if they were buried alive, then how? How did that occur? <laughs> That'd be an interesting thing to note. Also the flowers on the desks, like a memorial, right? I can't believe you don't know this, Utena. A hundred kids died at your school and you didn't know. I don't know how long ago it was, but it seems like something that would permeate out. Either way, we have a new combatant here that would be Kane, a new participant in the Rose Duels. And I love this. She's putting on the, like this deeper voice, this like, you know, edgy voice. Is everyone going to have like edgy counterparts? That's going to be so fun. Um, you know, talking about on this black rose, I'll grant death to the Rose Bride. Love it. Love this edgy shit. So here Kane is talking about which one of these is her true self. The outwardly bubbly one that she showed to everybody early in the episode, or this one? Is she putting on a mask right now? Or is she putting on a mask when she's performing in front of family friends? That kind of thing, right? I It's a mix of both. It turns out humans are more complex than the one time we see them, right? When you see me in this YouTube video right now, talking to you guys. That is an aspect of me. That is not how I am 
99% of the rest of the time that I am being. Um, that's just, but that's just what you see, you know? And I think we need to reconcile that as, as like a theme in the show. I think that would be great going through that because that's nice and healthy and stuff. In a show so much about putting labels on people and, and making sure they're perceived only one way, breaking out of such a system could be cathartic. <laughs> I'm going to be real with you. Again, how much of this is the Black Roses doing specifically? Like Spider-Man style? Is this fucking Venom Rose? Venom Rose alert? Um, weird tangent aside, like... Can we blame the rose for that, or is this actually me? I think, that, again, the healthiest thing to say here is this is just an aspect of me, and hey, I, I'm trying to be better about it, but that's just the truth. This is sometimes what I think. Sometimes I don't like my brother's sister. Wait, no, my husband-to-be's sister. Um, my brother's sister would be me. <laughs> anyway, again, focus. Be healthy I, we're gonna see this play out with different characters as we continue is my point um and we're going to extrapolate this out a lot more learning to live with these darker side of yourself either way we have a new song here as well which i should you know give some attention be thou a spirit of health or goblin damned whether thou bringst the with the airs from heaven, okay, bringst be the intents of hell's heart wicked or charitable whether thou bringst with the blasts from hell. Oh, the hell imagery is interesting. Again, under everything. The the underworld. Hell. Something. I'm seemingly remembering something about under the stage being perceived as hell from Review Starlight or something. Something like that. <laughs> I don't know, man. Thou comest in such a questionable shape, I bid thee. Well, thanks for asking. Speak to me. Further upon this night with a horrible moon, thine soul revisits us so. This mystery beyond human knowledge makes us humans dwarfed by nature tremble in fear at thy image. Definitely a very religious old English type translation. Um, bringing into sort of Dios, God, religion powers that be, who makes us like this, all sorts of stuff being explored in the lyrics there. Shapes coming up from below, what shapes they may take. Anyway, not much to say for the fight itself. There's a little bit of interesting dialogue here and there. So Utena apparently is being accused of not putting much effort in. Kane, the thing you said, swearing on the Black Rose to win the duel, to grant death to the Rose Bride. So again, confirming that she is looking to kill, aren't she? So is this going to work how I think it's going to work? Are we going to have to find a duelist every time, much like Kane, who wants, at least in some element, aren't she dead? Is that what I'm reading this as? Because last round, like last core, it was all about justifying reasons for why I want to possess Anchi, right? Mickey's had to do with his radiant thing, and then Judy's had to do with uh, kind of proving miracles don't exist or miracles can't happen, and it's all very complicated. Sayonji's was about uh, some eternal thing to get one over on Torga, and Torga's was mostly about power. We didn't really get a deep dive there. I still think that's coming. Um, and Nanami's was more focused on Utena and getting at Utena and wanting to kill Utena, right? Are we going to have to find more people like Nanami who actually genuinely want to hurt Anchi and then this arc is more about Utena protecting her and so she doesn't die. Is that is that a direction or is that just based on one episode? Because I like that as a, as, a, as a twist from the first arc. It's not just all these people wanting her hand, it's people that genuinely want her killed, right? Because their motives would align with Mikage and uh, Mamiya, right? That, that's the way I would take it anyway. Fine, I see how it is, so I'm not going to hold back. I'm going to put my life on the line so Aunt She may live. This coincides with the prince descending and, you know, doing the power of Dios thing, making her really strong. Again, this is visibly noticed by Kane, right, that this change is occurring, and then Utena proceeds to win. That shot looks very similar to the shot that's in the opening, actually, which is pretty fun. Right there. That's really fun. Cool. And then all the desks go into the four corners, revealing her kind of out in the open here before the rose seal kind of disintegrates. 
which is there, and then the sword disintegrates and we fall to the ground. You know, fall asleep, apparently don't remember that any of this happened either. Again, when this rose seal kind of disintegrates, the sword disintegrates, this kind of shelf in the moor gets pushed down into hell, even down even further from where we are. Yeah, burns even. Yeah, definitely. Okay, there's there's some there's some hell stuff here. Either way, at this point, Makage and Mamiya are just kind of sizing up Utena. Like, okay, I understand why she's pretty strong now. A mere facsimile of a duelist created when their heart is frozen has no hope of defeating her. When her heart is frozen, are we talk we're talking about the the guy that was in the thing, right? So we need stronger, more dark hearts to help defeat her. That's what I'm reading into this, right? The stronger the dark emotions here, the stronger of a duelist I'll be when powered by the Black Rose. Or maybe not. Maybe it's based on the person who used to own the Rose Seal and how good they were, and you're inheriting their power. Currently unsure. Either way, oh, the little, little smoke plume coming from the top of the hall as well. Something is burning. Either way, Utena is lost in thought before being interrupted by Anshi, who is going off to see her brother again. Same old smile. Looks like she's lying. Utena asks after Kane. Apparently she's just all better now and has forgotten everything. Which seems not great. That's not a good way to process anything. So it's that or, or Kane's just lying. I don't know. Either way, we're all very polite and we say our goodbyes to Anchi, or Utena says her goodbyes to Anchi, and Anchi says her goodbyes to Utena. But then Utena notices that Choo Choo's still here. Aren't you going with her? And then we have a look. I don't think... Choo Choo was invited, bro. Also, yeah, you're definitely just cutting the ends off beans, which is about the most boring thing you can do on a Saturday night. And then the intrigue. This is the hook for the rest of this arc, right? A rainy night, a rainy rendezvous up the top in the fucking planetarium. We have Akio looking sexy. Hell yeah. And she is here up in the tower alone with him. She takes off her glasses sits them on the table. Come to me, aren't she? We see her look like this. So much closed eyes with the smile, right? This is her actually looking at him without any pretenses, right? Like, just relaxed. Walks over to the couch there, right? Is she going to sit on the same couch? Maybe, I don't know. Uh, all the blinds shut. It's now a secret dark place where no light can get in. Where the only light we see is the, the planetarium lights. The dialogue here says from Akio, did you feel lonely this week? Yes, Onisama. Onisama. So much respect put on Big Brother here. Then we see the planetarium. Again, did you feel lonely this week? Like, you're lonely when you're not with me, which implies something romantic, I'm thinking. That, again, or I'm too crazy and incest brained and I don't know what else to tell you. Either way, that's the big reveal. Utena, none the wiser. And yeah, we move into further episodes with that, uh, with the little bit of the preview that we saw implying that we're doing something with Mickey's sister, right? Who I remember did have a name. Um, but yeah, I mean, she had a character design. She probably had something like this coming, if I'm honest. But, um, but yeah, that was episode 14. I talked this video is going to be long as fuck. <laughs> it's going to be way too long. Um, but that was excellent. That was fucking excellent. This show is so good. It rocks my fucking socks every day from 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 that way to that way. I love it. <laughs> I love it, love it, love it. Um, yeah, I'm very interested to see what occurs from here. I love this Black Rose idea. I love these new characters, new villains. Even if we repeat some of this content, it's good content to repeat. We're going to gain insight into these characters each and every time we go through such a process. And there's drama. There's drama here. There's hidden things. There's secrets. Things aren't what they seemed, though all the characters that we have seen up to this point are still in the show. I wonder how they will be engulfed into this. Mickey seems like a pretty obvious candidate, considering his connection to Mikage already, as well as whatever's happening with the sister next week. So looking forward to that. Uh, show is good. 
two thumbs up. <laughs> uh, chill stuff. If you like the video, consider liking the video. If you like the video and you want to see more, consider subscribing to the channel. Comment below anything you thought about the episode, anything I could do to improve my presentation. Comment below. I'm doing follow for follow on Twitter, so follow me on Twitter if you'd like me to follow you back. And the Discord. Join Discord. Love Discord. Discord, Discord, Discord. And I will return next week with two episodes of Revolutionary Girl Utana. Please look forward to that. And thank you very, very much for watching today. I'll catch you later. Goodbye.